Hi guys, welcome to another episode of U.S. History with Linux, and today we're looking at the Populist Party, a third political party that will rise up during the Gilded Age, growing from the frustration that small farmers were feeling. Corporations had started buying up small farms throughout the country and mechanizing them, and the small farmer couldn't afford to keep up, and they felt the government was leaving them behind. As a result, they start to organize, and the Populist Party is a result of that organization. So in this video, we're going to look at how the instability of the economy during the Gilded Age will lead to the creation of a brand new political party. Here we go. This new party, this Populist Party, is actually going to grow out of the farmers population. So we call it an agrarian revolt because it's the farmers who are standing up saying, hey, what about us? It grew out of the industrialism of the late 1800s. As the United States industrialized, the farmers, especially the small independent farmers, got pushed further and further to the end of the line. That's going to lead to the populism of the 1890s. And though populism doesn't last long in our country, it does influence a whole new movement in the early 20th century called the Progressive Era. So let's take a closer look at why the farmers rose up against the industrialized society that America had become. During the 1800s, small farmers were the backbone of the American labor force. In 1888, you can see we had nearly 8 million farmers in America. But by 1900, that number had dropped by at least 50%. And a lot of it had to do with the problems that you faced as a farmer. First of all, the conditions you had to work under, the environment, the weather, and not having any control over that. Prices for grain and cotton were rapidly dropping due in part to the tariffs that were being initiated by the government. Railroad rates were growing significantly. A lot of that had to do with the fact that the small farmers could not compete with the large pools of company that were coming together to get discounts and rebates. The farmers didn't get that. On top of that, the government was working to deflate the economy to keep prices down. Well, that's going to hurt the farmer in the long run. And so the farmers are going to start lashing out at the banks. They're going to start lashing out at other merchants, the railroads, the monetary system, the government, anybody who would listen that could help them. The other thing that was really hurting the small farmer was technology. And the reason why is more technology increased agricultural production, which on the surface sounds like a really good thing, except this increase leads to a surplus of grains and other farm products. And when you have a surplus of a product, that drives the price down. And the last thing the farmers need is another reason for low prices. So it really sucked to be a farmer during this time. There's no other way to put it. If you look from 1865 to 1913, all this area in red on this graph is time that it cost more to be a farmer than what they made. Meaning that the farmers were losing money consistently from about 1885 all the way to about 1907, 1908. So it's no wonder that so many people were leaving the farms and heading to the cities for jobs and why urbanization was just taking off during this time period. On top of that, the farmers didn't have anybody they could turn to. If you remember from other videos, monopolists had formed trust and laborers had formed unions. And the idea was they had this big group of people who could work together, but the farmers didn't have that. In fact, even though there were more farmers in the country than anything else, they will be the last group to organize. But when they do organize, it's going to start first as a social movement with the Grange, but then it's going to evolve and it's going to evolve into an economic movement called the Farmers Alliance and then eventually a political movement, 
a new political party called the Populists. When we first look at the social movement, the Grange, it got its start in the South and in Texas. It was an organization of white farmers coming together. And like I said, initially it was a social movement, but they start to realize that in numbers they can get things done. And so they start forming co-op associations. And they actually start passing local Granger laws, which set transportation rates both for long and short trips. And they also set max limits that could be charged to farmers for storage of excess grain. Now the Grange movement will start to decline by the end of the 1870s, but not before they have an effect in America. And that effect comes through some pretty significant Supreme Court decisions. In Munvey, Illinois in 1877, the Supreme Court upheld Granger laws saying that states had the power to regulate business and set price ceilings, such as they did for the storage of grain. Later, however, in 1886, Wabash and the Pacific Railroad Company is going to sue the state of Illinois, and the Supreme Court is going to say, hey, wait a minute. Individual states can control trade or business within their states, but it's the U.S. government that controls interstate trade. And interstate trade occurred every time a railroad line crossed over a state line. Economically is the next step for the farmers. The Grange died out, but by the 1880s, you start to see an economic alliance start to build. It was called the Farmers Alliance. And once again, it gets its start down in Texas. But there's also a Midwest Alliance, and they're gonna merge together to become the Farmers Alliance. They're gonna have more political and economic goals than social like the Grange did. And they're actually going to run candidates for office. By the 1890s, members of the Farmers Alliances controlled eight state legislatures and had 47 representatives in Congress. The farmers are starting to build a voice. The Farmers Alliance came together and they're gonna to put together a platform that's called the Ocala Demands. It's later going to evolve into what's known as the Omaha platform, which was the platform for the Populist Party. And their key planks, I guess, of their platform was they wanted the government to do something with the monetary policy of the United States. Basically, they wanted to see the money supply increase. What an increased money supply does is it creates inflation and inflation devalues the dollar. So now the farmers in that state have a cheaper dollar to pay off their loans. And it will also help them manage their debt and be able to get more loans. Because in case you didn't realize it, farmers are dependent on loans for their success. The Ocala demands also called for help directly from the government. They wanted the U.S. government to create federal storage sites for the surplus grain that they had in their possession. And on top of that, they wanted to take power away from private, large national banks and have the government set up sub-treasury banks throughout the country where farmers could get loans directly from the government at a much lower interest rate. These were the primary demands of the Farmers Alliance in the 1880s. And as we go into the election of 1888, some of these demands are actually going to be debated between the two candidates, Benji Harrison and Grover Cleveland. Now, Grover Cleveland is going to campaign on lowering tariff rates, which would be a direct assistance to the farmers. And you're going to see that this idea of a tariff is going to be the division between the Republicans and the Democrats. The Republicans, typically supporting big business, supported the higher tariff. That tariff is going to build business. But the Democrats supported a lower tariff, and so the farmers will support the Democrats. Going into the 1890s under the presidency of Benji Harrison, we're going to see our first billion dollar Congress. It was at this time that the Republicans had control of the House, the Senate, and the presidency. And this Congress passes the McKinley Tariff, a 48% tax on all imported foreign goods. This is going to have a profound negative effect on the farmers. It's also during this administration that the Sherman Antitrust Act is passed. Now this was the first attempt at Congress to try to rein in the monopolies and it outlawed combinations as well as 
restraining trade or preventing other companies from practicing trade. The problem is it didn't have a lot of meat to it or much of a backbone, but you are going to see the government start moving towards getting control of these monopolies and the industrialists in our country. They are also going to pass the Sherman Silver Purchase Act of 1890. Now what this did was it increased the amount of silver coins that are going to be pressed by the U.S. government. It's going to help the farmers in the sense that it is going to bring down the value of the dollar. So you are going to see a bit of inflation during this time. But this wasn't the full win that the Farmers Alliance was hoping for. You're going to see the result of this in the midterm elections in 1890. First of all, the Southern Alliance is going to gain more representation in the Democratic Party. And the Northern Alliance is actually going to run third party candidates. This is going to lead to another alliance meeting in 1892 where the majority of the Alliance members attend, along with over 100 African Americans. What you're going to see at this meeting is the joining together of a number of significant groups in the American society that felt slighted by big business and government. Groups such as labor organizations, the unions, and other reformers like Grangers and the Greenback Party. And they're gonna to come together under the Farmers Alliance and they will form this new political party called the People's Party or the Populists. And the Populists will set up a meeting in Omaha, Nebraska in 1892 in which they will construct their platform for the next election. You can see there is a lot that the populace wanted to accomplish. You should also be able to see through this list that some of the Ocala demands have indeed shifted over to the populist platform. Things such as federal loans to farmers, nationalizing the railroads, and abolishing the national banks. Now, not everything is going to get done, but what's fascinating is, though the populists are only gonna last for about 10 years, their ideas continue on. And when we get to the progressive era in the early 1900s, we're actually gonna see constitutional amendments that bring parts of this platform to life, such as the direct election of senators and an income tax. Well, that's it for this one. Hopefully you guys learned a little something about the populist party that you didn't know before. And if not, you can always go back and watch the parts you missed. Other than that, if you did like what you see, go ahead and subscribe. And I can't wait to see you on the next one. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.